let's go back to a conversation, I think, with all of the, uh, I, I think, to me, a very big question is, and, you know, it, it came from a paper that we just submitted uh, maybe a week and a half ago to Science Advances. Yana was the, the first author on it. And Yana, you cited uh, a very old quote. Uh, and, you know, the origin of life story goes back to Operon, and that's who you cited, and Fox. And I'm, I'm asking now, this was, I, I don't remember the exact year of Operon's paper, but it was probably- 1924. So it's 100 years, basically. So the question is, how much progress have we made, really? <laughs> I mean, we're still looking at individual. Now we have, OK, we have a huge amount of progress in, in protein structures, in, in, in computations, in, in chemistry, in, in all kinds of technical aspects of physics. And yet, we're sitting there trying to understand very, very simple questions of the origins of life, which is autocatalysis. And how does autocatalysis lead to a generation of new molecules that are autocatalytic themselves? Um, and there, there are many groups working on this across the world. Uh, LC has groups, I mean, obviously Jack Shostak has his his, his colleagues and so on working on membranes. And I'm just thinking about very, very, very simple thing, systems about how do we extract energy from the environment uh, as how do we make very simple electron transport chains so Jer Jeremy, you know, he explained that uh, if you drop a bomb into a cell, that would explode. And that's true. But we started out with very small grenades. Okay, so the grenades have energy and extracting the energy out of the, the H2, H plus two electron system is a small amount of energy. And I'm not even sure that's the smallest amount of energy, but it's the smallest amount of energy I can think of in the system. And it, it's not a, you know, it, it didn't disrupt very much. And in effect, what biology did, in my opinion, was it created hydrogen as electron carriers. So NADH, NADPH, FADH, these are elect, these are, are hydrogen carriers. So it uses the energy of hydrogen to either more or less efficiently create the hydrogen carriers. And you know, we don't really think about that in physics and chemistry very much. So Batul is a natural selection of chemical elements, obviously inspired by Bob Williams, um, who was an amazing person. But by the way, Batul, have you ever, did you ever meet Bob Williams? Oh, I'm sorry. He was a remarkable person. I mean, one of the most generous chemists that I've ever met in, in, in many ways. Um, he, 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 gave, he gave the idea to Mitchell for the chemiosmotic principle. Um, but the electron transport chain is a, a very simple thing that's found in all biology. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's just a very simple up or down the road. You put energy in and electrons go up, you take energy out, and electrons come down, and you're driving it to make hydrogen, basically, at the end of the day. ATP, I'm not going to go into because that's another story. But hydrogen is the source 
and sync of virtually, not virtually, all metabolism on Earth. So, as Betul, you're thinking about this in a planetary sense, and obviously Sarah does as well. Vernotsky noted that all organisms exchange a gas with the environment. Um, and so it's the gas phase of extrasolar planets that we can measure to some extent. And whether those gases are out of equilibrium thermodynamically is really how we're going to say, well, there could be life on planet X, you know, four light years away from here. So, but those exchanges are all, every single one of them, not just gas exchanges because they're gas exchanges, they're gas exchanges because of hydrogen. So denitrification is a hydrogen reaction. Nitrification is a hydrogen reaction. Carbon fixation, a hydrogen reaction. Respiration, a hydrogen reaction. Sulfur oxidation, hydrogen reaction. Sulfur reduction, hydrogen reaction. We're focusing on the wrong, wrong material. It should be hydrogen. The chemistry of hydrogen is the most important chemistry which we ignore. So the oxidoreductases to me are the core of life. That's, that's how I got to, to that concept. I'm going to stop now because I don't want to pontificate, but I just want to leave you with those thoughts and let's have a conversation. I guess I'm, I'm wondering your thoughts, Paul, in terms of the sort of exploring um, carbon fixation or nitrogen fixation or these different metabolisms and, and how do we then sort of, we, we create so much data right now, a lot of knowledge, right? A lot of information, maybe that's knowledge, yep. but uh, um, how do we then synthesize them all together to address the hydrogen uh, or the hydrogen chemistry? So, yeah, so we go back to a very, very simple concept of what were the folds early on that created hydrogenases and their reverse. So there are several hydrogenases. And I, I'm trying to, I think it was your slide that said hydrogenase didn't have much similarity to nitrogenase. But you know that nitrogenase is also a hydrogenase. I mean, two of the electrons that are used out of the eight, why would you use eight instead of six, right? So two are wasted making hydrogen. Nuts, totally nuts. Hey, Paul, I'll tell you tomorrow that it's not nuts and it, they're not wasted. Good. T tune in tomorrow. <laughs> uh, all right, well, tune in. Obviously, we're going to tune in tomorrow. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, uh, Bob Moore at Dalhousie wants to figure out where nitrogenase is in the ocean. He follows hydrogen production which is very cool. So hydrogenases, as I was saying to Jeremy early on, must have been the very earliest kind of metabolism-based, uh, earliest metabolism for life. Paul, can so I, I direct the, the conversation in a different direction slightly? Sure. I want to ask Sarah and Batul what their thoughts are on the uh, most ancient proteins on earth related to Luca in your analyses um, what are your thoughts on the most ancient proteins on earth I'm going to defer to Batu first because she knows way more about proteins and then I can offer some perspective from my side but that's really in her ballpark it's a, it's a very difficult question. I guess we can think about it in different categories. Are we referring to most ancestral functions? Are we talking about ancestral folds? Are we talking about ancestral structures or first sequences? 
So unfortunately, it's difficult to um, even address, e even if we simplify them to different subcategories, uh, this complex question that you just asked. Because if you think about the structures, you may, you, may, you know, you may think about certain poles that are conserved, uh, but then how do we pin them? Or how do we connect them with a certain function? Um, I think so we can at, at Rutgers, we've been focusing so much on oxido reductases. Hmm. And I was just struck by Sarah's slides showing ligases being much more uh, prevalent in ecosystems and in uh, genome and metagenome sequences. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, we've been so, spending so much time to reconstruct oxido reductases. Are we chasing the wrong thing? Hmm. I think you should probably constrain them based on the chemistry that they, um, they're catalyzing in early on, right? Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not quite sure, really. I, I do like the reductases, and I do think that uh, they, they probably are one of the early ones. But uh, it's, a, it's a difficult thing also for, for us because we don't quite know how the, the amino acid variability even impacted the selection of enzymes over geologic time. We know that the, they, they were varied. Um, so we are actually going to be doing some of that as a part of the MUSE that we are integrating amino acid variation model with Joanna Maisel here. Um, but at the same time, so I would probably think about the enzymes that uh, have simpler folds and um, also use amino acids that are also known to be more abundant in early Earth. I think lactase is matched for that, but I wouldn't just, go, of course, just think that it's one family of enzymes alone. Mm -hmm. So we found that the Rossman fold and a uh, Ferrodoxin fold were the two oldest folds, and they may have even had a common ancestor. But it's very, very difficult for us to understand the evolution of cysteine and yep. histamine, right? Yep. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a, a catch-22. You, you, you don't have these amino acids in meteorites, at least that we know of, um, so without those amino acids, was there a simpler fold that allowed the acquisition of a transition metal to transfer electrons? So you could have had, I'll, I'll give you aspartic or glutamic acid, no problem. Um, they're not going to bind easily as well uh, in the same way as a histidine or a cysteine. But, you know, this is the old Dayhoff problem, right? Masaori has thought about this a lot, about the earliest evolution of amino acids. Yeah, I mean, Mike oh. Russell was only going to give us glycine, right? So, so how, I mean, I'm, I'm waiting for Doug or Jenny to jump in. How about porphyrins, you know, rather than cysteine? How about like cyclization of polyglycine around a metal to, to form porphyrins? I mean, that's, you, you look at the chemical structure of porphyrins and it's, very similar to that of a peptide backbone. So it's evocative of, you know, a, a small peptide sort of cyclizing while coordinating a metal. This goes back a very, very long way in my history because um, David Mazzarell, when he was at Rockefeller, was a postdoc uh, who worked on the evolution of porphyrins in the 1950s. And I don't think we've gotten that much further along, but we know that porphyrins are very, very old. Um, and how do we know that? Malayamids are remnant porphyrins in the geologic record. They go back to 3.8 billion years old. Uh, Okuchi in Japan has, I, I sent him rocks from many, many rocks. Um, and he is probably the most careful organic nitrogen geochemist on the planet next to maybe, well, certainly one of the most. Ann Pearson at, at Harvard is another. But um, they find malayamids very early on. There's no other way you can make malayamids that we know of except from degradation products of porphyrins. And they're really, really, really old. So they could be contaminants, but they're much less likely to be contaminants of the drill oil, um, which is what has contaminated most of the geologic record for organic carbon and over geologic time. There's, uh, there's also a nice uh, NASA paper 
um, is like actually written in the 60s where they found uh, evidence of porphyrins in, in a bunch of different meteorites as well. Oh. Yeah. Can I bring the, the questioning back to what Nathan asked? Um, this this um, question about whether it were auxiliary dactyses or ligases or whatever. So uh, my feeling, and I may be completely off on this, but my feeling is that if everything is made up of basic building blocks, why does it matter what was the original function? What matters is the, the basic building block that made up all the other functions afterwards. I think Jeremy sort of addressed that issue uh, in the first lecture, which is you have to have some kind of basic non-equilibrium system mm -hmm. That is driven. That is driven by uh, energy out of what he calls the bath. I'm, I, I, most most in physics understand the bath. That concept is the outside world in some bizarre way. Um, but it has to reduce the entropy of the system. Right. And so ligases are not going to do that for you. The only enzyme system that I can think of that does that are the oxidoreductases. But this oxidoreductase may be built out of a protein cofactor, peptide cofactor, and RNA, potentially. Maybe. It could have, yes, it could have. Yes. Yeah. So I think from that perspective, the, the question is, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? And so if we are going to agree that uh, the peptide is what we consider life, right? then at that point, uh, its cofactor activity doesn't matter because it's a cofactor as opposed to the actual active element, right? So in that sense, it could be that these peptides then make up everything else that needs to be made up. So oxidoreductases and like, I, I tend to believe oxidoreductases were first, maybe because of UPOL, but uh, I, I don't necessarily think that that's a sticking point, is it? I don't know. Your your science advances paper that's under review looked at all proteins, right? Right. And we had some uh, ligases, uh, but the oxidoreductases were significantly outnumbering everybody else. Significantly is a good word because statistics allows you to be wrong. I just, I don't, um, I don't know why it has to be one or the other. I guess so I, these chicken or egg questions of the origins of life always perplex me because they're always couched in sort of what biology does now rather than thinking about sort of the fact that some of these functions that look very distinct in modern systems might not have been in early systems or that you might need the whole system to come together at once so even if you think about if you wanted to go back to Jeremy's systems it's sometimes it's like you know a synchronicity in a network or something that actually leads to the transition so you need all the component parts um, I can just say one more thing on sort of the, the stuff that we had about like this trade off between ligases and oxyreductases, which I didn't show, which is we've done these like network expansion experiments on um, the biosphere level network too, where you start from different random compounds and then you see sort of what functions you pick up in the network. Um, and just starting from random positions, you always pick up a lot of ligases first, and then predominantly like the bulk of the oxyreductases later. But that could be just because there's so many more oxyreductases uh, than there are ligases. But it says something about the distribution of them in the network and the way the system is actually set up. So I think we need to know also a little bit more about uh, the actual local topology of where these functions are located in order to address these kind of questions. So Sarah, can you build time machines in your networks? to reconstruct different uh, stages of evolution? Um, I think so. I'd like to get there. But I think what I really want to do is actually um, uh, sort of like there's these approaches in chem informatics where you don't really, you, you know, like we're, we're trying not to look at the specific molecules, but some features of their properties. So what I'd like to do is look at things that are sort of like biology, like what's the space of chemistry around biology and then reconstruct all the like all of the histories. Um, so um, so our life would be sort of one microstate of that ensemble, but then you would be able to reconstruct sort of a set of possibilities. Um, 
And the question is how much of chemical space do we actually have data on to do that? And that's not great. Um, but the assembly theory stuff that I didn't really talk about also allows you to talk about the relationship between molecules. Um, and it's actually, it's very powerful as a biosignature tool, but it's also very powerful as a cheminformatic tool for predicting new molecular structures you haven't observed yet or what chemical structures exist around a particular molecule. Or if you wanna think about like amino acid uh, histories, you can build the tree of all the sort of the relationships between the substructures of amino acids and how much overlap they have and things, which allows you to see something about why certain reaction sequences have emerged and those kind of things. So I'm very interested in moving that in that direction combined with sort of what we're doing at the network level um, so that you have sort of the molecular fragment evolution in addition to the actual reaction evolution. And that tells you something more about why biology is constructing molecules the way it is out of the set of possible molecular fragments. So Sarah, that, uh, using that as a gateway, I'm sure that's not where you were going to go, but <laughs> using this as a gateway. Um, we have done some analysis on uh, the bacterial genomes that have been completely sequenced, right? So this is a much smaller set, but still a lot of bugs. So it's something like 10,000 bugs that we have genomes for. Now, for these bugs, annotations exist for a minority of proteins. And in fact, what happens is you will have annotations for things that exist across the population of the bacteria, right? But uh, the, and that, that's sort of like a rich become richer thing, right? Where people will annotate things that someone else has already annotated, right? So I, I find that to be very limiting in, in terms of uh, studying uh, the biochemical pathways, right? So I feel like there is a, a world of functionality that we do not see simply because we do not see right now, as of now, sequenced homologs, right? Um, so I, I am kind of, I, I, I heard your answer in the sense that you were subsetting the data set uh, in order to try to estimate the, um, I guess, reliability of what you currently have. But I feel like since I don't know, 80 to 90% of the data is missing. Yeah. How reliable is the inference? And I also get more of the subtlety of your point now because you're you're also pointing out that it's not just that 89 to 90% of the data is missing, but the things that we see common functions across things are biased because we yeah. see that function somewhere else. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a more subtle point. I have to think about that a little bit more uh, carefully. Um, like I said, I think the, the best test of sort of the methods our group has been developing is to make some concrete predictions of missing functionality and then try to look for that function. And I would really like to try to do that. So I think like with this, this, you know, we have concrete predictions of what the ratios of different enzyme functions should be in a system. So if you, you know, don't, you know, you actually have an isolated system and you, you have a certain number of the functions that you know, then we should be able to predict what's missing and what the specific ratios of the missing functions are. Um, so that's definitely something that could be done, but hasn't been done and would need to be set up to do. So I think that would be maybe the best way of, of maybe within the limits of what we have now saying something concrete. Um, based on that kind of things you're pointing out, but it's a huge concern. I mean, from our side, like I always have this problem of like, well, we are doing the best we can with all the data that's available. Can we get better data? But of course, that's a huge issue too. <laughs> so, um, so I don't, I don't know. Um, but I think it has to go both ways. Like maybe we can make more predictions about what kind of data we need. Also, um, well, to your point, Sarah, I think you know what you're asking for is something I've been working on for a long time, which is basically a flux balance analysis of the globe. Yes. Okay. I want that very much with the local variation of the local exactly. environment. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so um, we can do that to first order. Uh, I tried to do that many years ago in that paper I wrote in science that review with Fenchel and DeLong, uh, which was the, the keg tree for life uh, of microbes, right? Of the planet. But we could do that for a flux balance analysis, I think. Um, and, you know, if you're just looking at the major elements, we could do it for oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, sulfur. Uh, and, you know, that's about all you need uh, to do that, I think. So I have to think about that. You know, I, I've 
I thought about that a lot, but um, I'm not a modeler. And um, at some point, you know, we need to be able to do this for a globe. Mm -hmm. And then you can tweak that because you can go then back to the Archean and say, I'm gonna take away oxygen from the planet, okay, for the moment. And what is gonna be the flux of sulfur? What's gonna be the flux of nitrogen? What's gonna, so if you don't have oxygen, you, go, you don't have nitric oxide, you don't have nitrous oxide, you don't have the oxidation states. And you should be able to predict, predict the isotopes of sulfur, nitrogen, carbon. Is, you know, that's, that's a pretty, pretty simple way of how do we, do we really understand how the planet functions globally? Right. So as a, as a metabolism, as a global metabolism. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, I think what like we've been trying to do is very closely related to that, but a little bit different, but I think that there's some interesting intersections um, in that we've mostly been trying to look at these sort of, so I, I would view sort of your flux of, um, you know, specific elements as a particular coarse graining of metabolism, because you yeah. don't care about all the details of the molecules or the reactions, you just care about what's the rate of these elements. And yeah, we're looking sure. at other sets of constraints, like what, what are sort of the ratios of functions, or what are the sort of properties of the molecules that are used. And I think if, you know, like we could, as an example, we could say, are there particular constraints on elemental flux, fluxes that are related to specific ratios of, of functions, right? And then you could say a signature of life, you know, being these ratios of functions is these particular sets of fluxes because it really constrains it. So there has to, so I guess what I, in short, what I'm saying is biochemistry is very high dimensional. It lives in chemical space, which is a very high dimensional space. And then we have to talk about fluxes through that space. But I think when you look at it in these particular projections, they're all related and constrained by the same physics. And we can build better models by having these sort of coarse grain representations interact with each other, uh, if that makes sense. I, I, I don't think about it that way. I think about it in terms of the energy in a molecule. Yeah. So this is coarse grained. I mean, when you talk about lipids, that has more energy per unit carbon, oxygen, I mean, carbon, 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 hydrogen bond than a sugar, than a protein. So you start working down the energy scales mm -hmm. and you're going to get to a very, very quick uh, system where the reactions of these various molecules are very, very tightly controlled because they have to interact with each other. Right. Um, so that is pure physics. It's pure physics, it's bond energy, actually. So are you looking for the signatures of the control? I'm, look, I'm looking for the earliest evidence. So let's think about this. I mean, we probably started out with a, uh, a world where if you could eat something, you made more energy than if you had to make the energy from the sunlight. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were probably a heterotroph in an anaerobic world. Not a great system, but it works. And so you start to look at those, those metabolisms as a very, very simple way of what did you need? You didn't need to generate carbon. You didn't need to fix carbon dioxide. You need to oxidize carbon dioxide in an anaerobic world. So you need, what are the, what are the electron acceptors out there, right? Everybody has an electron. You're, you're, you're talking about a place where electrons are a dime a dozen. So that's why I like nitrogen fixation early on. It's, it's, it's a place you can dump electrons onto N2. It's a respiratory energy sink. And at the same time, you get ammonia. I mean, let's just, just think about it in a coupled way. I mean, I was inspired most of my career by, by Ken Nielsen, Bob Williams, and, and a few other people. But um, I think about it in a very simple electron transfer energy world. Um, and flux balance analysis is 
basically that it's you know it's who's got what and what does it need right we'll be back tomorrow uh is anybody else want to say anything more before we say goodbye to each other for the day i thought the talks today were great on all all sides the the pros and the and and the the younger people i thought everybody gave a really good talk and i really want to thank all of you and i hope you come back tomorrow when uh we have berta hooker and dennis and dean and marcus ribby so if you haven't heard them talk, um, you're in for a treat. And hopefully your students will also listen. <laughs>